open the gate. But ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. Got to tell you something. Peter's outside. They're like, Rody, you're wacko. Okay, look what it says. You are out of your mind. But she didn't back down. She kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is an angel. They said, well, if you're not out of your mind, it's an angel. Verse 16, but Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him, and they were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, Peter described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. And so what we see here, God is still good when the servant is bound because God does what only God can do. There isn't a bunch of soldiers from another country. There's nobody from some, some church, some, some, the church of whatever in the area. No, no, this is God that shows up with an angelic being. And it says that when Peter stood up, the chains fell off. They didn't have to cut them. They, he didn't have bolt cutters. He didn't have a torch. They're gone. Walks out of the building, walks through the gate. I like the part about the gate open by itself. You and I live in a time where you can drive up and gate will open, you drive through. That wasn't this time, okay? And so he's walking towards the gate. I don't know what he's thinking. The Bible doesn't tell us what he's thinking, but I know what I'd be thinking. What I'd be thinking was, I got away from those guys, and now I can't get through the gate. Oh, me of little faith. But God is still God, and the gate's open, and he walks outside, and he starts going down the street, and he realizes the angel's gone. He goes to Mary's house. Look what happens here. Even though they were praying, it says they were praying there. Even though they were, they were doubting what God was doing. Because in verse 15, when they're like, hey, Peter's out there. Yeah, no, no. We're praying that Peter's released, but he's not out there. How many of us pray that way? Lord, I'm just asking you to do this great miracle. And then when the doctor says, there's no cancer, you're like, wow. What do you mean, wow? Weren't you praying? I'm praying for so-and-so to come to know Jesus as their Savior. Then you get the phone call that says, i got to tell you what happened. Last night, I was reading my Bible, and I came to know Christ. And you're like, wow! Weren't you praying? That's what's happening here. And so, you know, we see here that this whole arrival of Peter in verse 16 was amazing. It even uses the word amazed. They were amazed. But I love verse 17. Because Peter says, listen, here's what happened, and I want you to tell everybody else. Why would he say that? Why do you think he said that? That's it. That's it. Great. Let him know that God is still God. You pray, God answered. Tell everybody. Tell everybody to keep praying, because God is still God. See, I, I'm trying to make you remember that today. I want you to drive home, and I want you to be thinking about God is still God. Look at verse 18. Now, when, uh, when day came, now it gets to be morning, I want you to look at the wording. There was no little disturbance. That's a nice way of saying everybody was disturbed. Okay? You say, well, we don't talk like that. Well, they did in Bible days. There was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. Now listen, you got to keep in mind of something. That when you woke up as a soldier and the guy you're chained to isn't there anymore, you're dead. And when you go and check with the other 15 guys, because there were 16 of them, and you go check with them and say, hey, hey, dude, and they all say, we didn't see him, we don't know what happened, they're dead. Okay? Not because the Bible tells us so, and it does, but because... In Bible days, you were accountable for your prisoner. And if you didn't keep them, you paid the ultimate price. So look what happens here. And after Herod, verse 19, searched for him. Now listen, this is a big black mark on Herod. He is going to be a hero because he's taking out James. He's going to take out Peter. And now all of a sudden, he's gone. He searched for him, and he did not find him. He went and he examined the sentries. What that means is those people that were on guard... When he examined them, he took them one at a time, all 16 separately, to hear their stories. 
That's what that means. And so he took all 16 of them, he's sitting there, and he hears their stories one at a time, and guess what he found out? Nobody knew what happened to Peter. So what does it say in verse, uh, yep, he had him killed. He had him killed. <clears throat> and so he couldn't find him. He ordered that they should be put to death. How many soldiers did he lose? 16 dead because they couldn't find Peter. Why don't you look at the next sentence? Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Right in your Bible, right by that, he went on vacation. Because that's exactly what that means. He just went and chilled. He had 16 people killed, and he lost the guy that, that he wanted, and he goes on vacation. He just goes, and, you know, you, sometimes we have the idea that if we just get away from it all, it goes away. But how many of you know when you come back, it's still there? God is still God. And what God does baffles men. It baffles man. It just, you know, I don't, I can't even tell you how many times in my life when I've been like, wow, that was just cool. You say, well, weren't you praying about it? Yes. And sometimes I'm like, well, God answered prayer. That's great. And sometimes I'm like, wow. Amen? Because God is still God, and what he does, he does not ask me for his timing or anything else. He, he still baffles men. God is most glorified when there's no other options. I want you to think about that. God is most glorified when there's no other options. So does God know what we pray before we pray? The answer is yes. So why does God ask us to pray? And why does he wait to answer when he already knows? Because he wants us to be faithful in seeking him and coming before him. And you know what else what happens? When we pray and God hears it grows our faith, it grows our prayer, prayer life, and we get more and more dependent on God. Praise his name. So what happened to Peter? Well, we don't know exactly what happened to Peter, but what we do know happened to Peter was that he went and hid because Herod could not, couldn't find him because God is still God. Number three, God is still God when his glory is stolen. When his glory is stolen. You know, the Bible speaks uh, specifically to this. I'm going to give you a couple of verses here in just a minute about God's glory. But first of all, look what happens here with King Herod was angry, verse 20, with the people of Tyre and Sidon. The, the subject changes a little bit here. He was very angry with these people. Uh, and he says, uh, they came to him with, in, with one accord. They all came together. And, and, and having persuaded Blastus, um, I don't know. I might name my next dog Blastus. I don't know. But anyway, um, I can't I, I think of naming a person Blastus. Hey, Blastus. Uh, they probably wouldn't even let you go to school if you had that name. Anyway, um, they're afraid you're going to say it slowly. Blast us. Anyway, so they persuaded Blastus. And uh, the Blastus was the king's chambermaid, a ch chamberman. What that really was is a, a really trusted personal confidant uh, or assistant to the king. And when you see the word persuade there, this isn't the idea that they talked him into it. This is the idea that they bribed him. Hey, how much money would it take for you, Blastus, to uh, you know, go talk to the king? And so they asked for peace because... Okay, he didn't like them. He's upset with them. But look why they needed peace. Because their country depended on the king's country for food. If we don't make up to this guy, we don't what? We don't eat. Do you remember when the great toilet paper shortage happened? Do you remember that? Do you remember? I don't know if you saw all the different stuff about this. And, and I'm going to tell, tell you this, and I'm not joking. This is true. There was people that had garages full of toilet paper. Garages full. Garages full. Parked my car outside so I could fill a garage up with toilet paper. I might starve to death, but I got toilet paper. 
it was one of the most ridiculous things. My nephew drives truck, and he took a picture of the company up by my shopping, and there was tractor trailers lying down the road waiting to get loaded with toilet paper and paper towels because God forbid that our country should run out of toilet paper or paper towels. I, I just, I had this vision, you know, this, this little thought about, like, I can see it now. I run out. I look over at the neighbor's house. He's got a garage full. I go over there. I slap him. I beat him up. I steal his toilet paper. How ludicrous. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about this morning is food. Food. In other words, if I don't get some, I'm going to die. If you want to see people get totally stressed out, people go completely ballistic, people that go like crazy is people who are hungry. During the Y2K, some of you are old enough to remember that, we had a church member who, who is now with the Lord, but at the time, he, was, he thought I was mentally challenged, I guess, because, now don't say amen, okay, we already know it. But anyway, <laughs> he thought there was something wrong with me because I didn't go buy a generator and I didn't have gallons of gas in my house and whatever, and he stocked up on all kind of canned food and all this. He was ready for Y2K. And one day, about a week or so before Y2K, I said to him, did you ever think, you live on a hill, and people can see your house from pretty far away. I said, if all the lights go out, Y2K would have happened at midnight on December 31st of 2000, or 1999, actually going into 2000. I said, if all the lights go out, no heat, because, and we're in, we're in the coldest time of the year, and you're up there, and they hear this, and you have lights, and you have a refrigerator, and you have, how many times, how long do you think it's going to be before they come and take it? Obviously, we didn't need it. He had a generator and hundreds of gallons of gas, but he didn't need it. So anyway, look what happens here. See, they're begging for food. That's what's happening. On a appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an orientation to them. Now, they're, they're, they need food. But Herod is more interested in his self-importance. Look what happens here. These people are begging for food. He sees it as an opportunity to give a speech because he's concerned about his self-importance. They didn't need a speech. They needed food. Something happens here interesting because some of you have heard of Josephus. Josephus is a Jewish historian who said he, he did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. But he wrote thousands and thousands of pages of stuff. You can still buy his book, uh, his books today. Uh, you look it up, you can, Josephus, and it's his view of history during the time of Christ. And you see Christ in the picture. You see stuff like we read in the Bible. And, and you know what? His secular writing is endorsing the Bible's view. It's pretty interesting. And so right here, Josephus says that when Herod Agrippa went and sat down to give the speech, he had put on, in fact, Scripture tells us here, I just read it to you, he put on his royal robes. He said these were some, made out of some kind of material that reflected, and when he went and put them on, the sun was shining on him. And he delivers a speech, look in verse 22, and the people were shouting the voice of a God and not of man. Look in your Bible, and the word God should be small g. It's not talking about the holy God. It's talking about something worshipped. Hmm. So we see self-importance. Next we see self-value. He sees himself as something of, you know, it's important. Who I am, it's important. Okay. And notice here that he doesn't say, hey, 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 knock it off. Don't do that. He lets them believe he is a God 
He lets them believe he's that important. Over in Acts 14, when we get there in a couple weeks, we're going to see where the people fell down to Paul and to Barnabas. And they're like, no, 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 no. Because they already knew what happened. Be careful, folks, when people elevate you. Way back in the early days of my pastor, uh, pastoring, uh, people used to tell me things like, you did, that was a good message, whatever. And I was struggling with, like, what, what do you do with that? So I called my dad. My dad was my mentor until the Lord took him home. And so I said, <coughs> Dad, what do I do with that? <coughs> he said, just make sure you don't believe it and give it all to God. Look what happens here. <coughs> Excuse me. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. <coughs> so we have self-important, self-value, self-glorified. I am so important, but he wasn't. And I want you to notice a few words in verse 23. One is the words immediately. When did this happen? Right now. Because God is still God. Right now. God sent an angel down. Because he did not give God the glory. He was eaten by worms and breathed his last. You say, that's disgusting. Yeah. Some people believe he was eaten internally by worms. Hmm. Luke 4, 8 tells us, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Psalm 29, 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to what? His name. Due to him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. When you, when you claim God's glory, when you take the glory away from God, you, you are claiming war against God. And let me tell you what that is. Suicide. Because you're telling God that you're more important than him. But God is still God, and he always wins. Always. Self-glory will be judged. And in this case, very quickly and very decisively. There was no backing up. Boom, boom, there it was. It's interesting here. Peter's in jail. He's locked up. And who comes to get him out? An angel. Who come? Who came to take out Herod? An angel. Remember what I told you. They're servants. They go and deliver the message. With Peter, the message was, you're free. With Herod, you have stepped out of bounds. You have taken the glory of God. Your life is gone. Herod was 54 years old when he died. <clears throat> I want you to notice something. His position as God didn't last what? Didn't last very long. You see that? Small G-O-D. How long did that last? Not very long. But it's interesting. If you go back to Daniel chapter 2 and verses 20 and 21, I'll read it to you. It says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. But there's one more thing I want to share with you about how short of a lifespan he had as small G-O-D. When the tribulation happens, and I believe according to what Scripture teaches, that anyone in this room that's a believer will not be here. We will be caught up, the Bible says. We call it the rapture, to be with the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians, it teaches that. We won't be here. But there will be two things here that you and I will not miss. And one of them is called the Antichrist. And the other one is called the Great Prophet. And there's their time as G-O-D is short too. God casts them out of, 
out of the earth, off the earth, and throws them right straight into the pit of fire. God will never surrender his glory. Don't be stupid and try to take it. Number four, God is still God when his word is challenged. When his word is challenged. Verse 24, but but the word of God increased and multiplied. Now, if you remember back when we first started teaching in Acts, I talked about how in the beginning it says that God's word increased. And then later on it says God's word increased and multiplied. I told you to think math. Increased, now we're multiplying. Ching, 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 ching. It's just growing like crazy. God's word grew. When Herod thought he could take out the preaching of God's word, he failed. And God's word increased. It grew. And it multiplied. God's word increased earlier in Acts. And again here, as I mentioned, we see it multiplying. Second of all, God's word expands. Look at verse 25. And Barnabas and Saul uh, returned from Jerusalem and they had completed their service. They took the money, okay, and completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. God's word, here comes somebody else along that's going to be a part of the party that spreads the message that God is still God. It expands. It expands. And then we're promised in Isaiah 55, 11, God, that God's word succeeds. Most of you know that verse. It talks about his word shall never come back void. There's part of that that we often don't quote, but I want to give it to you today. And that is, it will accomplish, the Lord says it will accomplish what I purpose. In other words, God's word is going to do exactly what God says. And it's interesting because as we walk through this period of history and, uh, that we're living in today, we're getting closer and closer to the Lord's return. Amen? Amen? And if you look at the Bible and you study prophecy, you're like, oh, huh? Oh, oh yeah, okay. And some of us even get into some rapture practice. We're ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. If Jesus comes back this morning, that's cool with me. Rich told me today that he'd be good if the Lord just took him right when he was playing the keyboard, the Lord just take him. I said, do it at home. I don't want, to, I don't want you cleaning and making a mess here. <laughs> but I'm telling you today, it very well could be today that we meet Jesus. Let me, let me share four things with you that I want you to learn from what we studied this morning, besides the fact that God is still God. Number one, God's will of all is always carried out in spite of our circumstances. You cannot be in a place that that stops God's will. You cannot say something that stops God's will. You cannot do anything to stop God's will. God's will is going to be carried out regardless of our circumstances. You say, wait a minute, what if I married the wrong person? I've heard this before, okay? And that's why I'm using it. Why if I married the wrong person? God's will is still God's will. You know, God isn't going to say, well, you know, well, they're so-and-so. They married the wrong person, so now I can't do what I was going to do. God has known you before you knew you. He's not surprised. He knows what's going on. What if I work at the wrong place? What if God called me to be a missionary and I never went? God's will is still God's will because he's still God. Regardless of what you and I do, we cannot stop the hand of God. We cannot. Number two, God's plans are most often not our plans. And most of us can say, amen. Because we go through our lives, and we, you know, we, we have all these great ideas. All of us have plans and ideas. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. This is going to happen. Blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, when God gets involved, we're like, well, that really wasn't what I planned. But I got news for you. God's plans are far better because God is still God. Number three, God's desire is the furtherance of the gospel regardless of our plans. I want you to know that God's desire is for his word to go regardless of our plans. You say, well, I'm just not going to do it. I'm, you know, it doesn't matter. God's, if you fail to share the message of Christ with somebody, that person is not going to hell because you failed. God will bring somebody else. Stop and think about it. If, if somebody went to hell because you failed to witness to them, how many people are going to be in hell because of you? That's not true. I know, people teach that the blood of a person is on, your, on you. That's Old Testament, has nothing to do with salvation. 
Don't get your theology mixed up. God has a plan for us. If you get a chance to share the message of Christ and they come to Jesus, hallelujah, you get the joy of celebrating, amen? But at the same point, if you fail, God will bring somebody else along. Nobody's ever going to stand before him and say, nobody told me. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, Michael spoke about it the other week, that he will show himself that we are without excuse. Last night, I was outside with the dog. Did you see the moon? Was it gorgeous? The sky was clear. There's the moon. Today, I'm reading the Daily Bread. How many of you read your Daily Bread this morning? Okay. You know what I said about the moon? It, it was lucky. We're lucky we live here. We just got lucky we live on the earth. Read your Daily Bread. They're not. Daily Bread isn't saying that. The person they're quoting is saying that. Hmm. No, no. No matter what your plans are, God's plans are going to work. Number four, God's glory always belongs to him and only to him. If you steal the glory of God, if you in any way hinder the glory of God, you will pay the price. One of the things that popped into my thought process is... 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is talking about the Lord's Supper, and he's talking there about he, uh, the people that were coming to the Lord's Supper that were not right with God. And in the old King James, it says, and I don't, I don't know what off the top of my head what it says in the English standard, but in the old King James, it says, and because of that, some of you have fallen asleep. What it means is some of you have died because you're taking the lord's supper and you're not worthy of the lord's supper and i thought about that and i thought to myself how many people have died because they stole god's glory we have this scripture in the bible telling us about a guy who took the glory of god but how many other people even people you may have known that their life was cut short on earth because they took the glory of God. The glory of God belongs only to God. Be very careful that you aren't stupid enough, and I say that lovingly, that we aren't stupid enough to steal the glory of God. Because no matter what is said, God is still God. And for those of you that like to read ahead and study, we'll be in chapter 13 next week, the first three verses let's go to the Lord in prayer Heavenly Father may we not ever steal your glory may we Lord not ever question your authority Lord may we not point our finger at you and ask why Lord help us to quickly realize that you're still God you are God. You are still God. Let us not lose sight of that. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, this morning your word speaks about a time when your church was taking a beating. But you're still God. You were still glorified. You were still elevated. And the Bible says in the end of this chapter that your word grew and multiplied. Help us, Lord, not to run and hide. Help us, Lord, not to get discouraged. Help us, Lord, not to quit. Help us, Lord, to continue to make you known. Thank you, Jesus. We love you and thank you. In your precious name, amen.